So this is Europe Calling, the uh, a webinar series with actors, uh, the European, sometimes the regional or local levels, um, politicians, um, representatives, NGOs, or of, um, the industry. So bringing everyone together and citizens. And uh, tonight we're talking about the flood and uh, how powerless we were in the face of these, uh, this flooding. And after so many uh, casualties and relief work still ongoing, it's maybe time to start talking about what went wrong and how we can do better in the future. So how can we protect Europe and Northern Westphalia uh, against such catastrophes? What do we have to do? I mean, beyond climate protection in order to better adapt to the new climate, to be better protected against uh, such disasters, um, which bring casualties but, and destroy the livelihoods of companies and of many, many people. We have a variety of guests, Professor Hannah Clark. Um, she is, um, let's call her a flood guru. She's really the top expert in her field. She uh, co-designed the European flood, uh, flood alert system, the FAS, and will explain how Europe warned, how the system works and how it did work in this case. And then we're going to uh, continue with Verena Schäfer. She's an expert for home affairs, chairwoman of the uh, Green Parliamentary Group um, in Northern Australia. She's um, also the contact person for the fire brigade and the relief services. And so we can check what happened with that information that came from Europe. And then after that, we have the next speaker, Oliver Krischer, expert for the environment, climate and nature protection, the region. And he knows every bird in the Eiffel and he also knows the in, in individual rivers and streams, the affected villages and towns. So he's really the right kind of person for this. We had uh, many, many uh, registrations, almost 1,500 people um, registered um, for this webinar, and um, they'll probably join over time. And uh, please uh, tweet or forward this link so that more people can join. So we'll start with uh, Hannah, then continue with Rina and then Oliver. And then after that, we have a Q&A session. So you can uh, type your questions, your remarks. And then also please read what other people have asked and like the questions or the remarks that you would like to discuss, or us to discuss, you can do this in English or in German. And so the, that way, the best questions and remark will be at the top and we can talk to each other. This webinar will be recorded. So if you put your name down and um, ask a question, that will be part of the recording so that people who it later. Europe Calling is an interactive uh, session, an interactive series, and especially today with this uh, type of topic, um, with this very topical uh, discussion, that's particularly important. Many people have died, many people have lost their livelihoods, and we are looking for solutions together, even if at the same time we have to criticize how things were done. Let's uh, start with Hannah Cloak and look forward to your contribution. Hannah, please. Ich danke Ihnen für die Einladung, diesen Vortrag zu halten. Thank you very much for the invitation. Leider ist mein Deutsch verbessert. Uh, make this speech. Unfortunately, my German is not that good, and as the to topic is very important, I think I'd rather speak in another language, uh, topic. 
but this is something I know which happened okay. to British colleagues in the European Parliament. So are... I would like to talk to you about um, Europe's catastrophic flooding, uh, how it was forecast well in advance and what went so wrong. So I've spent a good, more than 20 years learning how to provide early warnings of floods for better preparedness. And I'd like to tell you today about what the European Flood Awareness System is as part of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. I'd like to talk to you about what early warning means for being prepared for floods. Think about what went wrong and how we can make forecasts valuable and also thinking towards our changing climate and how we can better prepare for floods. So I am a flood forecaster. I'm a climate scientist and hydrologist, and I helped to set up the forecasting system that was used to predict the recent floods in Germany and surrounding countries at this European scale. And I saw days in advance that they were coming. And then I read the reports of the rainfall and the river levels rising. And then I watched with growing horror as the death toll surged. And I truly believe that we should not see so many deaths from floods in 2021. This is simply unacceptable and something has gone wrong. So this is the European Flood Awareness System. I call this EFAS. You can pronounce it lots of different ways. Uh, you can go and look yourself at the website. Uh, I've put the web address there, efas.eu. And it's part of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. It provides early information on flooding to national and local to the public. So what is the Copernicus Emergency Management Service? It's got other bits to it, as well as floods, and the forest fire service is very busy at the moment, for example. It provides European and, in fact, worldwide comparable information on upcoming hazards such as floods. And for floods, we have the European Flood Awareness System and also its younger sister, the Global Flood Awareness System, which looks at flooding across the world. It provides early warning for the preparation of aid assistance to complement national and regional services. So not to replace them, just to support them with early information uh, and where some people don't have enough information and they can re rely on, on this European and global uh, information. There's also knowledge and transfer and exchange and improved data sharing, which are really important parts of the service. And there's lots of support for international organizations, particularly with GLOFAS. So in 2003, just, out, uh, just after my PhD, I moved to Italy and began working for the European Commission. And my job was to help set up the EFAS system. And this was following the devastating floods in Europe in August 2002. And the idea was these floods were so awful that we want, never wanted to see them again in Europe. You know, we have the technology to predict floods in advance and to take action, but so we never wanted to see this type of devastation again. Now I work closely with EFAS and GLOFAS, the global system, in my role as an independent flood scientist. And I work to improve and analyze the flood forecasts. So for example, we've looked at the monetary benefit of early flood warnings in Europe and found on average, it's kind of a 400 euro return on one euro's investment. So there's substantial value in using early warning systems. I've also worked with the Red Cross Climate Center and the UK government um, with tropical cyclones in Mozambique and, and other parts of Africa as well. We take action on the ground based on global, really quite coarse and uncertain forecast to help get people out of the way of devastating floods. EFAS has been very successful. I mean, it started on like one PC, one computer, and now it's supported by a supercomputer and several teams of scientists around Europe and communicators around Europe. So, for example, EFAS uh, provided information for the severe floods in the Balkans in May 2014. And there were warnings to both the Emergency Response Coordination Centre of the European Commission and the national authorities in these different countries eight days before the flooding. 
Now, it's not always possible to provide that information eight days before, uh, but the earlier you can get that warning, the better. EFAS sends out bulletins of early information, which are designed to be read and understood and acted upon by experts. They're not directly available to the public. Public flooded warnings come from the national and the regional and sometimes the local weather, environment, civil protection agencies. EFAS information must be used by these authorities alongside their own local forecasts. Old forecasts from EFAS are publicly available 30 days after a flood, so reasonably soon you'll be able to look up yourself on the EFAS website uh, what those forecasts are. This is the type of bulletin I'm talking about, uh, a flood notification email gets sent out, and the idea is that this is a heads up, okay, be aware, something big may be coming. And the idea is the recipients use the EFAS web interface for the details of what's coming, the subsequent forecasts, and there's also information on flash floods. So this is what an EFAS flood forecast might look like if you were to go on the website. This is a forecast from the 12th of July. Now EFAS flood forecast forecasts for major rivers. It can't look at smaller river basins below 2000 kilometers squared. It's designed for these larger scale look at what's going on in the whole river basin. So for the Rhine, uh, we get these red dots uh, showing that the river levels in the major rivers are you know, worrying and we should be looking at them because uh, it's, there will be a flood coming in these areas. But of course, as a hydrologist, you're thinking about all of the water. It must have rained somewhere for the water to run to those major rivers. So as a flood forecaster, you're looking at the whole basin and where that rain is falling as well and thinking about that across the basin, not just at the point where it says it might flood. So this crazy diagram down the bottom with the spikes, very, it looks um, very interesting. You don't need to understand the whole thing, but if we start at the three red dots down the bottom where it says Sunday the 11th, that's the beginning of the forecast that's issued here. And as we go along to the right, we're going into the future. If we go up on the diagram, the river level is going up. And the key thing to note is if we get into the purple, that means there's a serious flood coming. It's an extreme uh, threshold. It means you really need to pay attention to what's happening here. So what did happen for the Rhine? Well, definitely on Friday, July the 9th and Saturday the 10th for the Rhine catchment, there was a high probability of flooding. It actually said it would begin on Tuesday at that point. The forecast in the following days showed that there was little doubt that a major flood was coming. And the first EFAS bulletin was sent to the relevant authorities on Saturday, July the 10th. And updates continued to follow it over the following days as you get more precise predictions. As you get closer to a flood, some of the uncertainty disappears and you can be more sure about what's happening. There were formal flood notifications for authorities in Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, Switzerland, and Luxembourg, as well, of course, as the Emergency Response Coordination Center. So as the event neared and the uncertainty in the forecast shrank, the predicted start of the flooding was pushed to Wednesday for the smaller rivers and then Thursday for those larger downstream rivers. And there were around 25 individual bulletins sent to the Rhine and the Meuse Basin. EFAS is an ensemble system, and that means it takes into account the uncertainty in the forecast, and it runs lots and lots and lots of forecasts for the same time period. And that's really important because it allows you to think about what the worst case scenario is, and that allows you to make better decisions. So in this crazy spiky diagram that we saw before, the big kind of bars in the middle say, yeah, it looks like it's definitely going to flood because we've got the signal going on here. But they, there's quite a lot of uncertainty in the diagram. But the fact is, there's quite a lot of those ensembles in that purple bit. The sticks go right out into the purple bit. 
And that is the worst case scenario that you would use for planning, particularly for thinking about major things like evacuations if these are very large areas. So when you have these ensemble flood forecasting systems locally, they allow you to take direct action on the ground. But as I was saying earlier, we use this type of information uh, to pass to the Red Cross in Mozambique in a much coarser system at the global scale. This is what the flash flood indicators might look like on the website. So again, you've got the purple bit means there's extreme things happening. Um, and it looks for these smaller basins that you can't resolve, you can't see in the EFAS system. Uh, and it does, so it does things slightly differently. It just looks at the rainfall and works out how that flows over, over the land. And this additional information should be used again alongside the river flow forecast, thinking about the whole basin, but also, of course, the local forecast. So, for example, the information from the DVD or from the local forecasting systems. So clearly, tragically, the whole system that's designed to save lives by ensuring people act on warnings before the floods arrive didn't work as it should have done. Now, it might be that individual parts of the system worked exactly as they were designed to do. And it's certainly true that the forecasts I was looking at did, you know, they were accurate for what they were supposed to do. And there were definitely some warnings issued through official channels. So that's really good to see. And here I've put a depiction of what the early warning chain, as I see it, I borrowed that from the high weather project here, where you have some observations, you run some weather forecasts, you run some flood forecasts, then you look at the impact of those floods, where are the people, you know, where does it matter? Then there's a warning sent out, and then of course people have to do something in response to that warning as well. In some areas, many authorities did act in time to evacuate people, erect temporary flood defences, move vehicles to higher ground, but clearly this didn't happen everywhere. So I believe that insisting that the warnings were adequate and that agencies did their work well is like claiming that the maiden voyage of the Titanic here was a success because 99% of its engineering worked perfectly throughout. So, you know, too many people have died. So while this argument may be true on an individual scale, unless those people in power admit that the system did fail, they risk failing to learn lessons and put others at risk in the future. Science in a large part is about helping people to see the invisible. So I like to really um, urge people to think like this. What's the use of a perfect forecast if the people that it's supposed to warn can't see the danger that they're in, in their imagination. What is the point in using a giant computer model to predict what's going to happen if people don't know what to do in a flood? So effective flood warnings require people to be able to see into the future, imagine their house full of water, to assess the likelihood of that happening and to see the multiple paths they need to take to keep them, their family and their property safe. And here, sadly, we have seen what happens when people cannot visualize the threat of a river ripping down their street or a lake appearing in their house. And these elements of flood warnings must improve. Also, you need to have a really long memory to understand the risk of flooding, much longer than a human lifespan. There have been big floods in these areas before, but you no, know, people don't remember because they weren't alive then. If you want to see a little bit more about how, how floods work and how computer models work, um, there is a YouTube video here that you can go and look that I did a few weeks back for the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition. Now these are the warming stripes uh, for Nordrhein-Westfalen, I probably said that wrong, I apologize. The warming stripes were conceived by my colleague at the University of Reading, Ed Hawkins, and they show the mean annual temperature change uh, over the last 120, 40 years. So if you start on the left-hand side, uh, that's in 1881, 
and over to the right hand side, it's 2020. And as you can see, is blue and blue, and then it starts to get redder and redder and redder as we see the temperature change. And this is a really good indication that the, the reality of climate change is here. And I've been asked perhaps 500,000 times in the last few weeks, is this climate change? And what we can say is that these types of heavy rainfall and these slow moving systems that just dump loads of rain uh, in one place are the types of things that we would expect to see due to climate change. It's very difficult to do this with floods because we also have to think about what we've done as human beings as well on the ground. Not only have we uh, caused climate change in the atmosphere and heating up, but we've also put people in the way of floods. So people have moved into those flooded areas uh, and they are at risk. So risk mapping at the moment is really very difficult because we don't have all the information we need. We're in a changing climate. We don't have records from the 1700s, 1600s, 1500s of the very heavy rainfalls that have already fallen. And we've got rapidly changing villages, uh, towns and cities uh, to risk manage. So that's most of the things I wanted to say. I've probably gone too fast, I normally do. I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed that uh, little tour of um, my understanding of EFAS. Does also share uh, my horror at the number of people that have died in this event. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, very clear and uh, always when I hear British colleagues speaking at European events, it always leaves also a feeling of sadness. But uh, let me say uh, you are still fellow Europeans and thank you that you helped uh, setting this European system up. And uh, yeah, but I will hand over without uh, further ado uh, to uh, Verena, please Verena. Thank you. And I would like to thank uh, Hannah for the uh, presentation. I hope that you'll be able to also see my presentation, but I can uh, start already. Sven uh, introduced me already. I'm Verena Schäfer, uh, chairwoman in Northern Westphalia of the um, Greens Group in the Parliament, also a spokesperson for the uh, for interior affairs so and civil protection. So this has been my uh, area for a few years, and I would like to talk about uh, Northern Westphalia and uh, say again that uh, this situation of flooding is of course still at the top of the agenda uh, weeks after the event. So in many places, normality is, is still hasn't returned and I'm still talking to people in North Australia and Rhino Platinum, over 180 people have lost their lives and then so many people have been injured, have been traumatized, people have been have lost all their possessions uh, in the floods and we know that uh, recovery will take years and it's important for everyone affected also for the municipalities to um, be able to handle this and of course people are asking questions and the MPs are asking questions why uh, were people not warned uh, better? Why weren't they protected better? And specifically after this uh, presentation that we've just heard, I think these are questions are very relevant and that they're politically relevant. So let's start with my presentation. And the first slide. The main question for us is the warning chain. Uh, message chain. And so we've heard again that it was clear that flooding was going to come, a storm uh, 
severe weather event was impending and the problem is the issue is what was done with that so we had a meeting last week uh, of the home affairs uh, commission and on the 12th uh, on the 12th uh, um, so on monday the districts and the towns as the competent authorities received a storm warning by the german weather service but apparently there was no um, evaluation of the of this warning it was a message that was passed on without uh, comment so the municipalities were not asked to act explicitly by the uh, higher level authorities and uh, apparently there was also no contact between the ministry of the interior which is uh, responsible for civil uh, protection and the Ministry of the Environment, which is uh, responsible for flood protection. And another question that we have to answer is the question of the dams in Northern Westphalia. Because of the dry summers of the last few years, they were quite full at 97% uh, or more, so they, they weren't able to catch any more rainwater. So I think it would have been really, uh, it would have been necessary to have communication between the two uh, responsible ministries. And apparently there was no communication between them before the disaster. And that's not some, that's something that I simply cannot understand. And then the qu second question about warnings. So did citizens, were they warned? that they received the met message. And there has been a discussion. We know that people from the affected areas say that they didn't receive the message. They didn't hear it, didn't see it, or there was no message at a local level. Uh, for instance, by uh, using loudspeakers from uh, fire brigade um, vehicles. So uh, in part, that was just not the case. So we have to find out where um, people were really warned and where they weren't. And um, the Ministry of Interior in uh, Northern Westphalia says that's the responsibility of the municipalities and that it's their fault. But the land has the option to do this and has the option and, and possibility to do it. And they chose not to. And I think that we do have to expand our uh, warning system, sirens after the Cold War. A lot of them were abolished in Germany. We also need uh, cell block casting. So emergency uh, text messages to, to all uh, smartphones and to in a specific area. And also maybe uh, let's talk about um, self-criticism. So citizens have to understand what they should do in which uh, disaster scenario and, and in many places they just don't and another point that i think is very important when we're talking about warning the population the citizens then politically we we cannot uh, dismiss the government from its responsibility of course citizens have to be warned and then they have to act but my understanding of uh, civil protection authorities is that the the state is responsible for protecting citizens. And it's not enough to just tell them you're warned. This is a warning, but the authorities have to um, act and convince people and really um, make sure that, that they act on it. And that's another point that I would like to talk about. Authorities in Northern Australia did not draw the right conclusions from the storm warnings and uh, the uh, government under Armin Laschet in uh, Northern Australia is still saying it, it's all up to the municipalities, the rural and urban districts, because they have the competence. But this is a political question and it has to be discussed. So district administrations and mayors of the 54 districts in Northern Australia with their administrations, are they really able to evaluate and assess such a storm warning and make such major decisions as a, like an evacuation because that's um, actually overriding basic rights? Isn't that really something that should be done at the level of the land, at least to have the back of municipalities and maybe help them with such decisions? And apparently that didn't happen in Northern Westphalia. And it's a point that we would like to discuss further. And personally, I'm really moved by the question, um, what happened after the flood started in particular districts? So if you know Northern Westphalia, Euskirchen, for instance, and the night from Wednesday to Thursday, it was flooded. 
early morning Thursday, and only after that, Erfstadt was flooded. So it was after Euskirchen. And I think that when it was clear that uh, little streams became raving floods in the area, warnings should have been sent to other cities and municipalities and districts. And again, there was a lack of communication there. And I think that's another major issue that should be um, cleared up. So at the moment, we're still busy asking all of these questions, trying to find out what happened. And uh, we're trying to improve things. And I would like to agree with uh, the previous speaker. We have to learn from this and change things. And for civil protection, disaster management, we definitely need some changes. So these changes um, aren't supposed to be a criticism of the the relief services. So just let's take a look at the number of people who were active in um, fire brigades and, and relief services. So we have 100,000 members of the fire brigades, volunteers make up over 85,000 of that. And then we have other volunteers, uh, the technical relief service, uh, other relief services, the German Red Cross, the Maltese and Johannes Relief Services. So I would like to thank these, a big thank you to all of these uh, people, and of course, the members of the police and the Federal Army. So what I'm saying isn't a criticism of, of them. It's really about the structural issues in civil protection and disaster management. I think we need a strengthening of that. And maybe also a question of how to better involve uh, volunteers. Maybe that's another point. Let's continue. Three more points that I would like to quickly uh, talk about. I think these are points that have to be changed in disaster management. It's not an exhaustive list. That would be too much for this short presentation. So the first thing is um, a needs assessment for civil protection. So we have such an assessment for fire protection every five years at the level of the municipality, they have to be reviewed and adopted. So um, these are plans to um, analyze the risk, the potential risk at the local level, what protection scenarios. So how long will it take to get this X number of uh, firemen on the spot? and what, uh, what's the technical requirement, what equipment do they need, and then that's going to be adopted at the level of the district administration. And I think we need the same thing for civil protection because we need such assessment, needs assessment, in order to really be able to prepare for different scenarios, flooding, forest fires, longer um, blackouts. And these plans, should also contain warning concepts and uh, an entry of the of critical infrastructure on the spot and uh, different support plans and other things. And I think that the district administrations of rural and urban districts and the lower level um, civil protection agencies should adopt this every five years, just like they do for fire protection. And then the second point that has to be changed is the at the land level, I don't want to really go into detail of land uh, politics, but I don't think that municipalities should be the only ones to bear all of the responsibilities in such a serious situation. I believe that we have to have the option, the possibility for the lender in Germany to use competences at their level in a serious situation. So we, all, we would also need this uh, civil protection planning at the lander level and the Ministry of the Interior in, in Northern Westphalia would also need to be more than just a supervisory agency as it is now, but also be a proper disaster protection authority. And the third point we have uh, the BBK, which is the Federal Office for uh, Civil Protection and Disaster Management, um, a central office, and I think this should become, as this should really become a central office for civil protection. So 
At the moment, they're only competent if it's a defense case. Other than that, they're out. And I would like to give them more authority. I would like to, for them to have a coordination function. We don't want to centralize these competencies. It should be uh, should remain at the lender uh, at the lender level. But the lender le should be obligated to send information to the BBK, and they could help coordinate, send uh, helicopters, and they should be able to ask for information in order to be able to better and quicker coordinate help where it's needed most. And that was just a very short presentation. So we, of course, need a lot of other topics, volunteers, crisis staff. It's impossible to name all the things that are necessary, but just to say that the Greens of Notre Dame's failure, of course, um, are shoulder to shoulder with the affected people uh, in terms of immediate relief. Um, even as an opposition party, but these questions that I've mentioned now are going to have to be discussed because people have a right to get answers to these questions, especially to the answer why these warning mechanisms didn't work. Thank you very much, Verena. This was very clear too. And I have to say to Hannah, Germany in many regards is a very decentralized and complex country. And uh, this has become clear also in the presentation we've just heard. And uh, if you have something which is called the catastrophe protection emergency plan cannot function because the word is simply too long. But uh, before I make further inadequate jokes. I think I should rather have passed the floor on to Oliver Krischer, who is from the region, who has uh, been a lot in the region uh, lately, who is our uh, top candidate in North Rhein, from North Rhine-Westphalia uh, for the federal elections. Oliver, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Sven. I also brought a presentation, uh, but uh, my computer doesn't work at the moment. I try to show the presentation again to share the screen with you, but it doesn't seem to work. Well, I just speak freely and maybe later on I can show a few pictures. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thanks for the organization of this webinar. I am from the region, as has been said, and uh, unfortunately, the catastrophe is something I um, experienced uh, firsthand. I have to say that, uh, well, I belong to the people who for many years, uh, for uh, more or less 20 years, uh, speak about the climate crisis. We have uh, said that there will be droughts, there will be heavy rain uh, events, but uh, when then uh, these things hit your own uh, region, and I think uh, sometimes I, at 52 years old, I have heard a lot in my year, but I've been a lot in the region of Aachen, but then when you see firsthand in the region what happens, the whole problem becomes a different uh, or gets a different dimension. And I have to say very frankly, what happened here was something I could not have imagined in the past. And I try again to share my screen with you, hoping that now it will work. Let's see. No, I'm sorry, it doesn't seem to work, which is a shame because I would have loved to show you a picture now at this point of my presentation. Now I think uh, you should see a picture. Does it work? Can you see the picture? So this is Weisweiler. Uh, near Eschweiler. This is a picture I took on July 15th, on the Thursday. There is a very small river, a creek, 
you can wade through it normally and the water reaches up to your knee only. And he, you, here you see the entire uh, city center, uh, a few kilometers from where I live, was flooded. You see uh, a few cars. One of the cars is, uh, is uh, washed away. Uh, it was really apocalyptic for me to watch this, I have to say. And as I said, in my region, in the place where I come from, I could not have imagined this. And uh, I took many more pictures, had to take many more pictures during these days. I'm not going to show more of them, but uh, here you can imagine how it looked in many cities in the case of many rivers. Such a high water disaster, something which has become clear to me too, is uh, something which is locally, uh, uh, is a, which is a very local event, a few kilometers further, uh, life continues as always, or maybe you have a little bit of water in your cellar, but uh, a few kilometers uh, further uh, to the north or south or whatever, it's a real apocalyptic event. And now I would like to talk about the following. I would like to describe what happened in the Eiffel and I would like to explain also uh, where it happened. You see here a very rough picture or map of the Eiffel. Uh, maybe you know this uh, in Germany from your geography classes. You have the large Ruhr Lake, then the several uh, rivers. Uh, it's a medium range uh, mountain range uh, of up to 600 meters, i.e. not too high. And towards the north, uh, you have a slope falling down also towards the east. Um, and if you have a look at this, at, at what uh, uh, Ms. Kloke has uh, shown, here we have a map published by the European Commission. Here, for example, you see four very dark areas. These are regions where you had extreme uh, precipitation events uh, happening. And now I go back to my first map. Here, uh, what we saw uh, dark was this area here, uh, where you see the cursor. This is near Blankenheim and Dahlem. This is the southern part of the district Euskirchen. Uh, you have the source of the Ahr, the Öft, and the Ir Urft and the Kiln, which uh, then um, uh, drains uh, towards uh, the south, towards the Mosul. But uh, also in the region of Euskirchen, which I'm showing now with the cursor, uh, you had these uh, heavy rainfalls, these torrential rainfalls, and the water was kind of flowing down from the Eiffel Mountains, but uh, led to very different uh, situations locally. It was uh, a disaster here along the R towards Rhineland Palatinate. Uh, this has been mentioned, I believe. This is the region that was hardest hit in this event. A very uh, hit was also the Erft, this river here, which uh, drains towards the north, and then also the region around Euskirchen, which was completely inundated. And then something which Verena Schäfer mentioned uh, shortly afterwards, the region of Erftstadt was also flooded. And uh, you probably have seen all these pictures of Blessem, uh, this uh, little village which partly in a landslide uh, was drawn into an artificial lake uh, that was an artificial lake uh, for uh, producing uh, sand uh, for construction near the aft and uh, uh, the sheer masses of water led to landslides so that uh, part of the village was actually uh, dragged away uh, and what happened is uh, really cynical because uh, since uh, large water masses flew into this artificial lake in Bergheim, i.e. further downstream, the earth, uh, um, the earth uh, didn't cause much damage. Uh, so what happened was that large water masses, those which uh, inundated Euskirchen and caused the havoc in the Eiffel, then uh, remained in Erfstadt in this artificial lake, but also in the Erftener Bruch, which is a large nature conservation area. So that downstream there were no more, there was no more damage. Here the Urft, uh, which also has its source in uh, the Eifel, then drains towards the north. 
and which caused uh, floods and damage, uh, also damage to buildings which were completely destroyed in Gemund. And here you have the artificial uh, lake um, uh, with the river dam. Uh, which uh, were pretty full, but not completely full. So large parts of the flood uh, could be absorbed here. And that was uh, very lucky for the river, for the villages down, more down uh, uh, stream uh, in the Ruhr, Düren, Julich, larger cities of about 100,000 inhabitants, where you also had flood damage, but uh, less damage than in other areas. So this shows that uh, these artificial uh, river dam lakes uh, could absorb a part of the floods. And here you have another river, the Inde, uh, which has its source uh, south of Aachen, then flows through Eschweiler and Stolberg and caused a gigantic havoc there, which is a little bit surprising because in this re region, the rainfall was not so heavy, not as heavy as in the uh, high, higher parts uh, of the Eifel. Uh, maybe uh, at one point in an artificial river, they let off uh, uh, water. But what happened then is that uh, the water reached the Ruhr and Julich and uh, reached, uh, uh, the, uh, reached uh, certain mining areas, which then, but the mines then uh, worked as a retention basin and uh, prevented uh, heavier flooding in Julen. So Stolberg and Eschweiler, with about 40,000 inhabitants, inhabitants each, were heavily damaged, heavily flooded, but uh, not Julich, which is further downstream, because uh, these uh, mines, these um, um, overground mines, uh, worked as a retention basin, which was not planned at all. But uh, that uh, led to the fact uh, that uh, certain cities and regions were not hit. Uh, what you see here is also something which happened by accident, something, a picture I took on July 16th at uh, the artificial uh, lake of the Ruhr River Dam. And uh, for the first time after 40 years, there was an uncontrolled overflow taking place. Uh, but this was something which uh, caused uh, flooding downstreams, but uh, thank God, uh, not extreme flooding. Uh, so in this region, uh, we nearly reached the disaster, but not quite. And as uh, Verena said, uh, these uh, artificial rivers uh, were already quite filled up. And here we had an uncontrolled um, flow off. Uh, we were lucky that the dam was not damaged, but this is something which happened by accident, which could not be controlled anymore. And here you see what this little river, the Inde, uh, caused when it entered those mines. I was mentioning this uh, overground um, mines and uh, the Inde, which had been uh, engineered about 15 years ago, found its way again. Um, into its former river basin, into its former bed, river bed. And as I said, the water also was absorbed by the mines. I could mention countless other events, uh, show countless other pictures and tell countless other stories uh, which I've seen or been told in my region. And uh, if I... Um, make all think, think about us all, it makes clear to me that what we need is climate protection, climate protection, climate protection. That's the first thing we need, but I'm not going to talk uh, in detail on climate protection, which is not our topic today. But I'd like, like to say rather that we, uh, the Greens uh, in the federal Bundestag, we were discussing uh, the issue of uh, flooding together with uh, uh, Anton Hochreiter and others. Uh, we uh, need uh, high water protection. Uh, we have updated uh, our report, our paper on it, on this issue. And we think that systematically we have uh, to um, assess the risks, risks and then have to change the infrastructure accordingly. Because it became clear also to me in the last uh, few days, and this is something Frau Klo Ms. Cloak also said, what we have today is not up to date anymore. Um, it does not really um, take into account these heavy rainfalls we're having now. And uh, something very Reina Schäfer also mentioned, we have to help uh, people much more in uh, prevention. Uh, we have to uh, issue 
uh, clearer um, risk alerts. People live in the area. Uh, I was in the area. I have uh, the warning app, uh, Nina, and was looking at it, and all it said was heavy rainfall. Uh, but uh, the River Mua, which could also had uh, could have caused a disaster, uh, was not mentioned. Uh, so the warning me mechanisms didn't really work. So we need a new assessment of high water risks, and uh, we have to take into account or learn uh, what happened in the past, have to learn from the events of the past. This is also part of the discussion now that people say, well, in the past in the Eiffel, you had also um, um, high water events, but in the planning for today, these past high water events had not been uh, considered. So we need a new assessment and a central issue also for the Greens, uh, uh, which has been a very important issue for the Greens for years, which we try to push through in discussions in the parliaments, is that we um, need also um, landscape protection, uh, that we uh, do not just uh, soil the the the, the, the the ground, we have to revert uh, soil um, sealing and we have to make it possible for the high water uh, to flow into uh, retention basins or flood, base, flood uh, plains. But in certain valley areas, in certain parts of the country, um, many building activity has taken place in the past. And um, uh, it, if we just have uh, not enough room anymore for the floods, uh, then there can be uh, things like dams which are over flooded or break. And uh, we're talking a lot about um, sludge cities. Um, what we need is that we um, have more green areas in cities and villages, that we have more absorption capacities uh, for um, water so that uh, we can, uh, do by doing this, prevent inundations. And what we have in our artificial lakes and our in our mining areas is that in the face of such heavy rain, uh, we have to consider how new methods for technological high water protection um, can be developed. Because because it's maybe better uh, that we uh, permit a, an artificial lake to overflow uh, than uh, that uh, human, human life is lost, uh, livelihoods are lost uh, as it happened in many places. So these are things which we have to analyze uh, looking forward anticipatory, in an in anticipatory manner and uh, especially there where we have uh, areas available in valleys, we have to improve the absorption capacity of the soil. And something which is a very important lesson from the disaster, we have to discuss on how the reconstruction now is going to take place, how we are going to plan for the future, how we are going to learn from the past, from what we've been been, been experiencing now. Uh, this is important for urban planning, um, because in some areas, maybe we shouldn't just not build any more. These are uh, analyses we have to carry out in the future. We have, uh, we mentioned this in a comprehensive manner in our paper, and uh, I'll mention the paper or the link to the paper also in our chat so that you can have a look at it in this paper in which we um, try to contribute to the current debate and express what is necessary to be done now as a reaction to this crisis. And uh, well, as I said, the first thing we have to do is climate protection because the causes of these uh, more and more frequent and more and more extreme uh, events uh, are what we have to tackle. This is our central task. Then, thank you very much. Yeah, vielen Dank, Oliver. Thank um, you, Oliver. That was uh, also very clear, and it was good to uh, really see the rivers, uh, to be able to imagine um, what it was like, and uh, that was quite helpful. I hadn't seen that in the media before. So uh, many people have made uh, very interesting uh, comments, but before I start reading those, after this uh, report from Northern Westphalia, I would like to give uh, the floor back to Hannah. So uh, what's your impression? Do you have any comments? Is that the typical situation for flooding uh, for a country that is as rich as Germany, that things have gone this way? And we, of course, all uh, read what you said in the Times. 
So I'm looking forward uh, to your impression as an expert and would like to give the floor back to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I stand by my comments that we should not be seeing this number of people dying and clearly lots of different things have gone wrong. Um, I was very interested to hear about the accidental retention basins, um, you know, from, from the mines. And um, so actually it could have been a lot worse because this obviously wasn't planned for. There are lots of different things that need looking at. The, the risk planning, definitely. Um, um, Ms Schaefer talked very clearly about that, and I think that's a very urgent problem. So it is much wider than the warnings and the forecasts. I talk about warnings and forecasts because that's what I live, that's, that's what I do for my job. Um, but we must remember all the other pieces in the chain too. And I uh, thought Herr Krisha's comment about um, uh, making the soil porous like a sponge to soak up the heavy rainfall where we can. Um, so using as much as possible uh, nature-based solutions is a really good idea. However, for these very, very heavy rainfalls, there must be an alternative strategy. Um, and you know, the minimum is get people out of the way because people are fragile and, you know, okay, houses are expensive, but people are fragile. Ja, vielen Dank. Um, ich werde jetzt mal die Thank you. I'm going to start uh, looking at the first written comments, the ones that have been liked many times, most times. So they're at the top. And the top ranked comment uh, was made by Christoph Scheuer, member of the Greens in Bad Neuerweiler. So that I think is in Rheinland Palatinate. And that's not our main, it's not our main topic uh, today because we are talking about the structures in Rhine, Rhine, Northern Westphalia, but I'm sure we'll have the same discussion about Rhine Palatinate in the near future. Here in the R area, there were lots and lots of railways and uh, road construction. And so the river basin uh, was narrowed and the flow speed was increased. And so in this narrow R Valley, the question is how to avoid such a flood wave in the future, and especially for us, the district town of Bad Neuner Arweiler, the R is completely channeled. Almost all schools and uh, daycare centers are quite close to the river. And so the result of all of this is that they've all been affected and uh, there's nowhere to go, to go for the children. There have been 14 schools affected in the R Valley and the entire valley has been uh, is under construction. So we do need experts to help us um, to not make the same mistakes when we reconstruct. Um, Many uh, questions, uh, so for instance, Jürgen Müller asks why the IFA system isn't available to the public. So why can you not um, see those um, those warnings? And Jutta says in, in response to those questions that every authority has access to the warnings, but they're only uh, forwarded to the national level. And wouldn't it be possible for local levels to subscribe, to be obligated to subscribe to these warnings as far as they're relevant to their area? That was Jutta's question. And then another question uh, by Gerald Christian Heinkes, also uh, directed to Hanna. He works in European integration. His question, question that's interesting for all of us, to all of us, why don't we have a European level um, task force, a civil protection task force for such uh, catastrophes like uh, flooding or forest fires, which are quite frequent to help. For instance, 
uh, fleet of 100 uh, um, firefighting uh, helicopters, so an EU uh, fleet of such helicopters. So these are the first uh, few questions. So maybe to start with the situation in Atal, maybe Oliver could uh, answer that because he knows the region, even if that's not really um, the area we're talking about today. Yes, the situation in the Ar Valley is, of course, dramatic and has to be said very clearly. What happened there, that's not just a, a consequence of uh, sealing the soils. And even if you had had a different construction policy, you wouldn't be able to uh, prevent it because we have uh, the mountain range of the Eiffel and uh, they are not uh, sealed, um, the mountains themselves, but there are other factors. On the higher areas, we have uh, more and more intensive agriculture. So probably soils were more absorbing in the past than they are now. And over the past years in the Eiffel uh, mountain range, we've had a lot of uh, dying, uh, forest dying. So if you know the Eiffel, you've seen large uh, areas. We used to have trees um, mainly fir trees or pine trees, and uh, they, they, they disappeared. And of course, as well as for the Uft Eft, for the R as well in the valley, vast spaces have been uh, sealed with concrete. Of course, uh, that's a, a, in some projects there were uh, political um, discussions, but in the end, the wrong des decision was made. And so if you take all these factors together, that just makes the flood wave that would have been there anyway much bigger. And I think that's the problem. So we have to make sure that we learn from this disaster and uh, make sure that we prevent something like this in the future, even in such a low mountain range area as the Eiffel, how can we retain water? How can we make sure that these factors are eliminated that made sure that the flow rate was even quicker? How can we reverse that situation? And um, that's really the task. It's not just the task for the Eiffel area. I think it's for the whole of Germany, maybe for the whole of Central Europe, because we don't know where the next heavy rainfall will be. Nobody knows. And um, well, we have the Bergische Land, the Sauerland, Hagen, other areas in Germany with similar events, which just illustrates that this is a question for everyone now, an issue. And it should be something that is dealt with at the federal level. That's why we made such concrete proposals to do that, and to make these changes. Verena, maybe uh, you could uh, come in at this point if you want to. Okay, I'll just uh, add one more question because it, it fits quite well with this topic. Rudiger Kitsiki has asked this question. In future, shouldn't there be a public debate in order to avoid flooding of houses to have a different um, building plan. So the houses that were in flood zones should not be rebuilt and uh, rivers should be renatured. Maybe Verena on this. I also wanted to say something about the other two questions. I'll start with that. Let's start with Jutta Paulo's uh, question about the EFAS data, why it's not publicly accessible, or if it would be possible to um, uh, make lower level authorities uh, subscribe to them. So as far as I know, the EFAS uh, results become part of the National Weather Services. So the German Weather Service did issue a warning um, they started issuing their warnings on the, on the 12th of July, and this warning for Northern Westphalia, I know that for sure, the warning was sent to the uh, land level, but also to the municipalities, the lower level, to so the protection uh, services agencies, the district level. So for sure, the municipalities received the warning. The question is what um, how is the warning um, forwarded? Is there 
an evaluation, an explanation of what this means, because and how is a decision made on the basis of these warnings in order to evacuate or not? Because I think that's the the point, because we need a better interaction between those uh, in the crisis staff who are responsible for, uh, for ordering an evacuation and the experts at a higher level in authorities who actually know how to read these uh, storm or severe uh, weather warnings, who have the hydrological data and, and, and know how to look at uh, flood uh, risk maps and know what this amount of water could do to specific um, local areas. So I think that is the issue to have a closer interaction there more communication, but I also said in the very beginning of my presentation that we have to talk about whether just the district administration and mayors can really be the ones in the rural and urban districts to, to make this assessment and to take these far-reaching decisions. And so I do think that the land level has to be strengthened in order to be able to make such decisions at that higher level. And then there was another question on Europe and the question whether we need a task force. So at the European level, there is a reserve of various types of funding. So we do have some uh, planes for firefighting, uh, but the planes are not so useful in Germany. We kind of, uh, helicopters work better, but they also have um, emergency helicopters and um, European member states can uh, call upon uh, that reserve. So at the European level, we probably need a bigger reserve. That, Sven, that's your part, Europe. That's probably something for you to look at, but in principle, that's already, it's already there, but maybe it has to be expanded. And then the third question was, uh, what do we have to change? I think that Oliver could say more about that. That's not my area of expertise, but of course it's an important discussion. And we as the Greens are in this discussion now, also about uh, reconstruction and recovery, that's not easy, but we have to talk about settlements in high-risk flood zones, of course, and think about it. So that's uh, definitely one of the issues uh, at hand now. Hannah Cloak, particularly as far as the transparency of the European system. So why isn't everything uh, publicly available? That's a question for you. Thank you. Um, so the member states themselves all around Europe have decided how EFAS is available. So it depends then on the national decision chains what happens to that information. Now, I'm a big believer in open data. Now, I don't represent Copernicus. You know, I'm an independent. I have this opinion myself. I think everything should be open. Uh, but I must caveat that by saying a single warning voice is really important in getting people to take action. So at the local at the local level, you need one person telling you that a bad flood is coming so that you can take that decision in an emergency. And if you have all these pieces of information, it can be very confusing and then you don't know what to do. Um, and we've seen that in other disasters as well, where there's too much information uh, reaching the local level. And EFAS is a European scale course early warning system. It's designed to trigger this heads up, oh, something's coming. It's not designed to forecast at the local level. Now in Mozambique, we use it because it's the only thing available, okay? But in Germany, you have some of these structures here already and you have abilities to you know, install sirens in, in these very flash floods, these rapid response catchments and get those warnings to the people locally. Um, you know, there is, but there is a case to be made in, in the current environment where we have, you know, institutions like Google kind of producing things like flood forecasts and lots of companies now starting to think like this. Maybe, maybe we're changing the way that we look at flood forecasts and we have to do better at, at, um, at thinking about where people are getting the information from. 
but it is the member states themselves. So Germany has decided along with the other member states that it should be behind closed doors. So I can't change that. I would, you know, I understand people's frustration at not being able to see the information that I could see. Um, I, I would like to comment, I think, as well about the um, risk mapping. So I do, I do really understand in these rapid response catchments where you've got people living at flood risk and there's nowhere to go. You know, you can't build further up because there's a mountain or, or whatever. That's very, very difficult. Um, and you have to balance the risk then. Um, the, the minimum you can do though, is have one of these siren systems that, that functions preferably, you know, that, so you do trigger, you get a trigger from right upstream, um, you get the heavy rainfall, and then that allows people the half 30 minutes, you know, one hour that it needs to get out of the way of something that's happening. That's the minimum that you should be doing. You should also be mapping exactly how badly it could be. And you can do this with the same idea of having a worst case scenario. You know, you need to understand the uncertainty and what we're dealing with to do with climate change, to do with the way that we've changed the landscape. These are not easy things to run in computer models. So um, I, you know, these are important things to think about. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. And there is a special question for you. Uh, I have to switch the language to channel now. So, uh, and I will, it has been put in English by Helga Schmidt, who is the correspondent in Brussels for the public uh, broadcasting service uh, of North Rhine-Westphalia VDR. So, uh, so the question is, uh, can you give us examples for professional and fast reactions to IFAS warnings since 2002? examples from other EU member states? And second, uh, to what extent is German federalism an ex explanation for the slow reaction after July, July 12th? Mm -hmm. So I can talk about where I come from. So I'm here in Reading, we're on the River Thames. Um, it's a relatively small river, but it's not a flash flood catchment. Uh, and the Thames has flooded very badly uh, and caused a lot of property damage and very few deaths, a lot of property damage. And you can, uh, in the UK, we have the Flood Forecasting Centre, which is a national collaboration between the Meteorological Office, the Weather Service, uh, and the Environment Agency at the national level. And they have a, a special office that sits together where the meteorologists, the weather forecasters, and the flood forecasters talk to each other, they train together uh, and they know how to react in an emergency and they support all of the local offices, um, the environment agency offices who are responsible for local flood warning. And they provide that inf information and the expertise and the interpretation of these early alerts that you might get, which are very uncertain and you know, can show that there's something bad coming, you need to do something about it. Now in the UK, we have, you know, we have a reasonably robust flood forecasting system anyway, uh, but it doesn't go so far back. So when we had some of the floods in 2013, 2014, we could see the signals coming through a week in advance for some of those um, flood warnings. And that's enough time for somebody to pick up the phone and have a conversation about how we need to get a national supporting civil protection um, something rolling, something moving, to have a discussion to get people ready uh, to, to perhaps evacuate people or take more action on the ground. So from my own experience, I've seen it that it can work. And equally, um, you know, I've seen it work in Mozambique. So the, the GLOFAST system, I'm going to say this again, it's Corsa. It doesn't have the information coming in from all the member states. It's just run on a big computer model with as best as we can manage with satellite data. Uh, it's uncertain in its course, but you can still take action on the ground early enough by communicating that information. But you have to have the expertise in interpreting it. 
So some of these questions about local authorities getting information, that's fine, but they must understand how to use the information. And sometimes that's better when you've got somebody supporting you who's day job it is to use this information all the time uh, to, to kind of explain the context of what it means in, in local rivers. There's a lots of different types of river that have flooded here. Uh, and so you need the local expertise. There's wonderful um, discussion about all the rivers that have, have been flooding here. I mean, I know this information because I'm not familiar with the region, um, but I can tell you about the um, probabilities and what that might mean. and uh, how you might think about taking um, a worst case scenario approach. You know, there th you know, there is this chance and it's a reasonably big chance when we're thinking about it, that we've got a very serious more than a one in a hundred year flood. I uh, probably haven't answered all of the questions because I've forgotten to. <laughs> Leider Gottes kann man nie alle Fragen vollständig Well, it's uh, never quite possible to answer all of the questions, but uh... One uh, question that interested a lot of people uh, was posted by Dirk Wilhelm about a similar uh, topic, nuclear waste and floods. Mr. Krischer and Ms. Schäfer, what do you think about the project in Würgassen, uh, Northern Westphalia, uh, in order to use the retention uh, space of the Weser uh, to use uh, 80,000 uh, square meters and to seal 50,000 square meters in order to uh, construct the ZBLLUK, whatever that is, that was an abbreviation. I'm sure the speakers can explain it and you can read the question yourself. So it's basically about uh, depositing nuclear waste there and the risks maybe you could explain in your answer what it all means. And uh, he says that it's really not the best zones uh, with heavy rainfalls, topographically um, not the best area. Oliver Verena, um, who would like to start? Well, I can answer the question because uh, I've been dealing with this and I know the citizens uh, initiative which exists there. I've been talking to them. Um, and uh, a very critical discussion is taking uh, place about uh, the mine uh, Conrad in Lower Saxony and uh, then the a storage site which is planned there uh, and uh, th these are the discussions which are taking place um, there are very uh, virulent discussions taking place locally and uh, flat risk is also an important factor in this uh, respect uh, for this uh, storage area for waste um, uh, which was going to be built uh, where we in the past uh, had a nuclear power station, which shows how crazy we were in the past. And this is something which has to be assessed uh, afresh in the light of the uh, flooding events that have just taken plan, uh, place. And Sven, I'd like to talk about the uh, more uh, principal question here, because we have to understand uh, that uh, the high water we have had now um, it means that things have to be reconstructed. And uh, I'm not aware of everything that's taking place in North Rhine-Westphalia, but I think uh, we are not the first when it comes to taking into consideration such uh, heavy uh, rain events. The last uh, government in North Rhine-Westphalia had a heavy rain concept, uh, but when Amin Laschet became governor, uh, this concept disappeared. So this is something that has to, to be discussed now. And what has to be discussed too is that uh, the uh, regional government in North Rhine-Westphalia um, has uh, reduced the uh, measures for uh, flood prevention. Uh, for example, um, the prior right uh, when it comes to buildings for local communities, uh, when they wanted to build uh, flood protection, uh, has been reduced under Armin Laschet. 
and then uh, the, 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 the water framework directive, which is also a positive uh, for flood prevention, um, has been uh, considered less uh, by the new by, by the current government. So these are the issues we have to uh, touch upon in the political discussion because all these uh, little things, this which which appear minor things are nevertheless very relevant when it comes to protecting people. And I think uh, that um, as Professor Cloak, uh, it is clear uh, these uh, extreme weather events will also happen in the past. We will always have flooding. But as far as I understood uh, the science, it's very important or crucial that we find a way uh, to reduce the extremes, to mitigate the extremes, uh, which uh, are already triggered by global warning, uh, that we uh, have more have to have more drainage possibilities in the future. And I'm from the region, I live in the region. I uh, say that uh, when the next flood comes, I don't want to have retention areas, which are just by accident retention areas. No, I think we need an anticipatory uh, flooding uh, or high water policy, uh, which uses the areas um, which exist, which are possible for drainage at, Erft, at the Erfte Bruch. That would be necessary, uh, would be necessary elements of a really anticipatory policy. And then as to work us, and I would say we were lucky at the or at the Orge, at the Meuse, where all these rivers uh, uh, which uh, drain into the Ruhr, well, um, we were lucky that the high water was not that extreme there, um, uh, so that uh, the nuclear power station there was not uh, hit. But uh, this is also something that has to be taken into consideration when we talk about high water. And this doesn't only concern Germany, as a matter of fact, but also Belgium. I don't see any uh, direct um, response now. So I take up another question by Maria Wiesmiller. In order to prevent high water, water and uh, droughts, and in order to minimize the risk uh, of disaster, it is among other things also important to keep water in this on the surfaces, renaturation, um, re retention in meadows and so on. Uh, other EU countries which are um, in the avant-garde here, uh, and what we can, what can we learn from these more ex uh, advanced uh, countries, and which which would be the um, arguments uh, with which we could uh, convince uh, German politicians? Ms. Cloak, uh, maybe you can answer this. Yes, sure. Um, so there's lots of different things that you can learn from different countries. Uh, so here we've got lots of rivers flooding um, that are larger. Um, and for smaller floods, there's lots you can do in terms of um, renaturalizing the river and making the soil soak up the rainwater um, perhaps um, putting more trees in um, and also have these natural retention basins. And we, we've seen um, lots of projects that I, I know about the projects in the UK and in the Netherlands uh, that, that look at these types of solution. But we also need to think about these very fast, rapid response catchments that we've been talking about. And there, you know, making the soil more porous is not going to help. Um, putting some trees in is not going to help because they'll get washed out um, and destroy something. Um, it, so you need to think of different types of solutions in these areas. Uh, there are, for smaller floods, certainly you'd be able to have many, many very small retention basins to catch as much water as possible. So that, that's that's something that you, you can try. Um, and even so in the relatively low highlands in here in the UK, we've been looking at you know the multiple um, uh, rain catching zones there. But I will say again that it's very important to realize that for these very, very heavy rainfalls in these flash flood catchments, um, that that's not going to help. And there will always be these very big floods that will overwhelm even the natural systems. So there's certainly something to learn about naturalizing and using the natural landscape. Um, we have programs here in the UK, um, working with natural processes, um, really using agricultural landscapes and practices as well to make sure that we're soaking up all of that water and keeping it available, both for drought and for flood protection. So involving the agricultural sectors is really important in that sense.
Vielen Dank, sehr klar. Um, Thank you very much. That was very clear. I have two more questions here, which uh, refer directly to um, civil protection. Christoph Scheuer again from Bad Neuen Ahrweiler, from our local uh, party, Green Party there, as to the discussion on warning apps and cell warning uh, via your um, uh, smartphone. How can they help when there is no uh, electricity anymore? Uh, when uh, you don't have a reception, when uh, the mobile phone network doesn't work anymore and you're cut off from all sorts of communications. In the R Valley, um, the relief workers uh, had no possibility to coordinate among one another because of that problem. And then the second uh, question asked by Barbara Kanafka in schools, she says, there are disaster uh, exercises which are carried out, and we have these also for the population. These are questions, I think, which uh, Verena should maybe answer. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for these questions. First, first of all, as to uh, the topic of alerts, we talked about warning um, prior to the disaster, but uh, it's also important what happens when there is no network anymore, no electricity anymore. And therefore, um, uh, civil protection experts uh, say that we need different warning systems, uh, for example, apps, but uh, besides them, the classical sirens. We have to say that in uh, Germany, after the end of the Cold War, uh, the political situation was uh, so that we said we don't need this anymore. The whole uh, civil protection in Germany uh, was not uh, paid much attention to, uh, but now we are starting to, starting to think uh, afresh about civil protection. And um, uh, we started, I think, uh, at the beginning of the 2000 years, and in North Rhine-Westphalen, we say that uh, as to our firefighters, uh, well, we had to, uh, first to reform our uh, law on firefighting in 2015, um, and it became clear uh, that uh, there was a political, uh, political shift in our landscape. And then uh, the topic of sirens. Well, in many uh, local communities, uh, sirens were um, discontinued. I think we need them uh, in the future. But we all, you also have to think that sirens and siren alarms have to be understood by the people. So what uh, does it mean when there are certain alarm um, tones that are sent out? And I'm no exception to that. I wouldn't know how I have to react when there is a flood and there are certain siren tones that I hear. But this is an understanding we don't have in Germany anymore, uh, also because we don't have that many natural disasters in Germany. So what I think is that uh, this is something we have to discuss more and then uh, the ability to help oneself. Uh, this is something for which uh, the local communities are responsible. This is something we need more for our population. But we also have to think about the problem at a higher level and uh, have to think about how we can uh, make information that reaches the local population better uh, over the radio, maybe, or other ways when there is no electricity anymore. These are many uh, topics I think we have to discuss. Then uh, the question of uh, disaster exercises at schools, I have to say, I uh, was born in the middle of the 80s and I've never carried out or participated in a disaster exercise at school. So I can really not talk about this. Uh, I don't remember any such thing. And I think this also shows that altogether, uh, we have to, um, strengthen civil protection in Germany. And uh, I'd like to um, send out a political call to uh, pay more attention to civil protection in the future, because uh, we know that because of climate change in the future, it is very likely that we will have more natural disasters uh, we have to deal with. And uh, therefore, we need to reinforce civil protection. In uh, home affairs, I think, uh, uh, we have to talk about uh, the police. Uh, we talk a lot about the police, and this is OK. Uh, but we shouldn't forget civil protection, which uh, definitely has to be strengthened. Uh, we have made first steps, but I hope that uh, 
uh, we uh, stop this kind of silo thinking uh, that uh, the home affairs uh, ministers of uh, uh, the federal countries um, remain within their field of competences, don't want to pass on competences to the federal level. Um, this is um, something we cannot afford in the future anymore. I think uh, the way I see it in North Rhine-Westphalia, we have to, 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 to understand uh, this disaster as a break with the past so that uh, in the future we have a stronger civil protection. This will cost money, certainly, but I think this is money well invested if it means that we can uh, protect human life and uh, I think this is uh, a huge task uh, we have to tackle now after these uh, disasters. Well, thank you very much. Thanks very much for all the answers. And here Oliver uh, is telling me that he would like to say something on the, the issue of river dams and this uh, has to do with something that Dr. Lohmann from the Wuppertal Institute uh, said. He said the Wuppertal River Dam or the artificial lake of the uh, Wuppertal was full. There was a very short reaction time of only two hours. And the question is, what do we have to change here? And uh, why didn't we let off water earlier in order to have a huger buffer? Oliver, please. Well, this is a very important and very uh, just question, because I've shown um, at the example of the Ruhr that uh, it was more by accident that we could prevent the worst. Uh, this shows that these river dams are something very important in flood management. Uh, many of them are very old, were built by our grandparents. Uh, many of them are over 100 years old. Uh, some of them are very controversial. Ecologically, they are controversial. Uh, but when it comes to flood protection, they can play a very important role. And in the last years, it became clear uh, what was the following, what was the, the most important uh, problems, something I know also from the area of the Ruhr. Here we understood uh, that we have to change the role of uh, these river dams and artificial lakes because uh, they have to retain water uh, for uh, the droughts in the summer. What has been happening now was the exact contrary of this. And uh, at the Wuppa, uh, this was obviously a very big problem and this is something we have to discuss at the political level we have to wonder how we have to manage these uh, artificial river dam lakes in the future we have to find a solution uh, for uh, droughts and also for flood, flood protection but what uh, we certainly need and this is something where we have to do a lot i believe is uh, and this is also something professor cloak uh, Oh, sorry, uh, what I mean is that if there is a warning from Professor Cloak, all the operators of these river dams have to be informed so that they can let off water before the high, um, the, the, the high water events or heavy rain event uh, comes. In North Rhine-Westphalia, uh, this seemed not to have worked well in all cases uh, during the last floods. And now the connection is very bad, unfortunately. What happened in North Rhine-Westphalia was that uh, many of these artificial lakes were too full and uh, no water was let off before uh, the heavy rains. So I think uh, this is also because in the past we remained too much in our silos. And I would hope that in the future, um, the, in, polit in, the poli in politics uh, of uh, the federal states, uh, we talk more about uh, how we manage these uh, river dams and river dam lakes, because they can play a very crucial role in flood protection. And uh, okay, one colliding uh, area is drinking water. Uh, we need drinking water protection too, is something we know from the region in Aachen. Uh, despite uh, um, in Aachen, uh, the priority was drinking water and not uh, flooding. Uh, so we have to discuss uh, all issues. It would not be acceptable as a matter of fact that uh, we do things um, at the um, uh, to the detriment of uh, drinking water. Mm. 
I have one further question from Anna Seidel, which I think is a question to Verena. The question is, as to the alerts, don't we need uh, clear provisions uh, which tell us uh, at which water levels, uh, what kind of evacuations have to take place, which uh, is the way it is done uh, when old bombs are uh, found and have to be um, and have to be um, cleaned up. So um, normally the responsibility or the competence is at the local level, uh, but a catastrophe of uh, this uh, uh, magnitude, uh, as uh, Hannah Cloak said, is something uh, these people have no experience with. The last time uh, something like that happened was maybe a hundred years ago. So uh, don't we need more clarity on uh, who has to do what in which case uh, when which alert is given out should this be um, said uh, or explained in the alerts how do you see uh, this in the case of north rhine westphalia uh, how did the the alerts uh, how how were the alerts issued yes i think you're absolutely right i think uh, uh, these uh, various things would have to have, which have to be considered at the same time, drinking water, di disaster control, and so on and so forth. And then uh, the different expert um, departments um, at the local communities or, or at the administrations. Um, and the question is, what does a certain water level mean? Uh, what kind of uh, reaction should happen when there is a certain water level? I think this is absolutely uh, necessary. A very good question. I'm not able to answer this question, but I'd like to take this question with me and uh, bring it into our discussion uh, among us. And I'd like also to um, um, advertise this idea of uh, civil protection, which has not been created by us, the Greens, but I'm talking also with the Association of Firefighters in North Rhine-Westphalia, and they have always called uh, for uh, including into uh, disaster control and civil protection uh, planning also in this regard. This is what we need, I believe, and uh, high water is one scenario which has to be considered among other things, and part of a central civil protection plan has also to explain which uh, mechanisms exist and can be used in which case Uh, we have to uh, incorporate um, flood risk maps so that we can understand uh, where such disasters can happen so that we can uh, take uh, action where it is necessary. This is something we need at the local level, I believe, and uh, this is something we have to make possible politically uh, in uh, our law in North Rhine-Westphalia. It is uh, provided for that uh, we have uh, disaster control planning uh, but I think there are no um, municipalities or city councils uh, which have already had a vote on this, also as to the firefighters. So we need more um, uh, compelling uh, provisions here for uh, civil protection, for disaster control um, as a precautionary measure because uh, we cannot prevent the catastrophe, but we can prevent that uh, people um, are harmed by these catastrophes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think um, our energy levels are going down. It's relatively late. And uh, if somebody wants to say something more, uh, I would give you the possibility only if you want, it's not necessary. And then I'll, I'll uh, say a few uh, concluding remarks. Hannah, Oliver, Re Verena, uh, Verena has said everything which is a priority for her. Everybody is fine. So I'd like to say the following. So, uh, from the uh, European uh, point of view, it was a European catastrophe. And uh, the many um, dead casualties and the 
pictures, uh, photos from um, Belgium are just uh, as horrible as uh, the pictures from the French Failure or from France or from Rand Palatinate. And uh, after um, the presentation of Pro Professor Cloak has become very clear that uh, there are uh, ways to forecast this. And if everyone uh, um, responsible in Germany had this uh, kind of clarity, then I, I guess we would have been um, a step further. But uh, yeah, federalism is uh, brings a lot of advantages that municipalities uh, have their, um, are really um, also responsible and hundreds of thousands of volunteers um, getting people on board, the fire brigade uh, volunteers, the relief services uh, volunteers. That's very typical for our uh, country. And we do want to strengthen and develop that. But at the same time, and uh, in addition to the subsidiary system, in many situations, we do need more uh, stronger decisions from a higher level. And in many situations, we can see that the higher levels of administration in Germany aren't able to make decisions fast enough. And uh, in many areas, that's also true for Europe as a whole. And uh, as a MEP, I would like to say that I uh, thought what uh, Oliver told us about the very different situations of individual rivers was very interesting. So to topography and geography plays a role and whether it's an uh, environmental uh, conservation area, whether forests uh, have been um, managed in a way to have absorbing soils or not, so that they can't even fulfill their um, natural function. And the same goes for agriculture, uh, whether soils are still uh, absorbent or not, the type of agriculture is important. These are questions that we have to look at and Europe has to become active. And at the same time, in the field of forestry and agriculture, we need reforms in order to avoid new disasters and work for climate adaptation. And what's particularly uh, important uh, for me, I uh, announced that in the Environmental Committee, I really want to work systematically on the area of law enforcement. And we do have the Water Framework Directive, which is a very good a European framework say, uh, saying that all rivers by 2015 should have been brought to, to a more or less natural state. And then you can, and that hasn't happened. And you can uh, delay by um, six years twice. So by 2026, you have to have done it. But in Germany, just as in many other member states, no plans have been made in order to reach even that goal of 2027, sorry. And under the red green government, Johannes Wemmel in Northern Australia has done a lot. And it has to be said that Armin Laschet actually went into reverse gear on these measures and uh, cut the budget for renaturation and flood protection along a German um, rivers, and the, there aren't even any plans to reach these European objectives to make sure that by 2027 all rivers have to be in a good state. I mean, that is an infringement of European law. It's against the spirit of European law. And a year ago, over a year ago, I have put this on the agenda in the Parliament, and I'm always urging the Commission to introduce infringement procedures against all member states uh, which don't have uh, these plans in place. And uh, Ms. van der Leyen, was very quick um, to go uh, to the local level, and that was very positive in Belgium in this case. But I also expect her to start European reforms and make sure that flood protection and re renaturing re our rivers has taken seriously, because it's not just a climate crisis, it's also a biodiversity crisis. And that would be another uh, issue that uh, we could um, manage by making the rivers uh, more natural. And I think that's a central question for Brussels. Why has the commission not started the infringement procedures? Isn't this something where the commission could, the EU could exert more pressure in order to avoid such catastrophes? I mean, it's been said very often that renaturing, um, making rivers more natural are not uh, a, 
cannot protect you from extreme flooding, but it would make it less aggravating. So, Verena, next week you have to speak at the uh, Parliament in Northern Westphalia. We're looking forward to your speech. You have received a lot of input tonight, and uh, I think you've written a lot of things, noticed a lot of things down on your notepad. This is a discussion that isn't over. Of course, we've had lots of papers on uh, civil protection, climate adaptation. We've um, started lots of papers and it's going to continue over the next few months. I would like to thank everyone. And I'm sorry that we only talked about Northern Westphalia, but we're all from Northern Westphalia and that's um, really enough to fill a couple of hours. And I do believe that in the other uh, areas that were severely affected, there will be a discussion with the citizens as well. But um, in North Rhine-Westphalia, and that's a, a, a particularly, we had so many casualties, but we don't have anyone missing at this point. And I understand that regions who are still looking for people who are unaccounted for are in different uh, situations. They're not ready for this type of discussion yet. I would like to thank Professor Hannah Cloak that she took the time, uh, even uh, so close before a holiday, um, to speak to us. And of course, we are still very open and feel a strong friendship with um, Great Britain. Northern Westphalia has a very strong ties to Great Britain and uh, Boris Johnson is not going to spoil that for us. We hope uh, and look forward to any type of cooperation as the Green Party, uh, despite this uh, sad divorce, we're still trying to make sure that uh, all our relations on all levels between uh, Europe and, and our regions and the regions of Great Britain will continue. And so I'd like to thank everyone and uh, hopefully see you next time on, during Europe Calling. And all the best to you. Have a great summer as far as that is possible and see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>